What is up, guys? Welcome back to Project Freelance. This week on the podcast, I am talking with an audio engineer and producer, mixer, masterer. He does all kinds of stuff. His name is Josh Schrader, and he actually produced the first single that I put out with Chasing Satellites, which was called Chasing Satellites. I'm going to play a little bit for you now so you guys can hear what he did on my song, and then we will jump into this episode. If we do not destroy ourselves, I believe that we will one day venture to the stars. When our solar system is all explored, the planets of other stars will die. So right before we get started with this episode, I need to thank our partner, which is Liquid Death Water. If you don't know what Liquid Death Water is, don't worry. I've got an ad coming for you in three, two, one. From the streams of the Austrian Alps comes a new kind of water. A water that is sure to raise you from your grave. If you're tired of buying cases of plastic water bottles that contain carcinogens and God knows what else, or if you're trying to lower your waste footprint. Liquid Death comes in beautifully rugged aluminum cans. Murder your thirst with a can of Liquid Death. Check the link in the description and use code just the letter K at checkout for 10% off your order. Liquid Death. Murder your thirst. So yeah, if you guys want a discount on Liquid Death Water, use the code just the letter K at checkout and you will get a discount. There is a link down in the description. You can click on it. It will take you straight there with the affiliate code. Thank you guys for supporting the podcast and supporting Liquid Death Water with all they are doing to give back to the environment. We appreciate you, Liquid Death. Thank you for partnering with this podcast. All right, without further ado, Josh, will you please introduce yourself and what it is you do to the Project Freelance audience? Hi, my name is Josh Schrader, and I'm a producer, engineer, songwriter um, out of Michigan, Canadian-born, moved here in 2000, uh, been doing it ever since, work with a lot of cool bands and record labels. It's a lot of fun, good way to make some uh, money, pay the bills. Awesome. So tell me how you got into music in the first place, especially this genre of music. You're in, you do a lot of like heavier stuff. So tell me how you got into music in the first place. Um, I just kind of played around in bands when I was a kid. It was, I started on bass with the logic that everybody plays drums, everybody <laughs> plays guitar. If I play bass, my logic was I can play in a ton of bands easily. And I did because nobody had bass players. So I bought a cheap bass when I was a kid for like, I don't know, 50 bucks. It was like some Frankenstein someone made. <laughs> um, stole my dad's stereo and used it for a bass amplifier, which he was not happy about. Um, and that's kind of how I started, just playing in bands. And I just you know, messed around, nothing too crazy serious. Um, I started, you know, doing some band stuff when I was in Canada. And then once, you know, I essentially met my wife online in 98, 99, somewhere around there. I moved out here in about 2000, um, and that's when music started picking up again out here. And then I was just playing in bands, playing in bands, eventually got signed to a small record label, did recording for all the bands I was in just because I never had any money to do it, mm -hmm. to go to studios. I'd love to. I just never had the money for it. So it was just out of necessity. I just ended up doing all of the demos for the bands I worked with. Um, and then we did some touring, and I remember one of the bands, they were called Outrun the Gun, they approached me on one of our last tours as we were kind of just winding down the band thing. Um, and they said, hey, you did your album. We think it sounds cool. Here's our budget from the label that we're on. Could you do our record? And just like my brain kind of had this explosion moment where I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, I can – this is something I can actually like – make money off of and actually like do as a job so i never really like consciously thought about it it just kind of like because i was so involved in music for so long the opportunity eventually just arose 
just by being around music so much. And I just never put two and two together until it was literally put in front of me and said, here's the money we have. Can you do this? I'm like, well, heck yeah, I can do this for sure. This is way better than Target, wherever I was working at the time. But that's kind of the, yeah, in the nutshell version of it. Yeah, it's interesting how the universe kind of paves this path for you, you know, this this direction you're supposed to go in. Sure. And it's, it's so interesting that it kind of fell in your lap at the end of a tour. And, you know, that's how I've gotten some of my gigs. You know, for example, I filmed uh, Lacey Sturm's first single, Rot, for her music video. And I had gotten that gig because I was out on tour with Escape the Fate doing photo video. Ah. And we were doing the summer festival runs. And Lacey was also playing the festivals. So I would shoot her when Escape wasn't playing. And then... Next thing you know, her manager calls me up and is like, hey, do you want to come out to Pittsburgh and film a music video for Lacey at the end of the tour? And so it's it's just so interesting how the universe kind of paves that path for you. Yeah, I think it's the opportunity of the of the moment. You have to be mm-hmm. obviously ready in the moment. And, and when they see you and they, your material is out there, it's just like, well, yeah, you did this. You're right here. We're talking about it. Yeah, yeah. So if you're involved, I mean, it won't happen if you're just sitting at home. You can be right. really great. But if you're not involved in some way, shape, or form, it just the opportunity won't be there for you to grab when it does happen. Absolutely. So tell me about that first record you produced for a band that wasn't your own band. Tell me about that process yeah. and, and what you learned from that. Cause I'm sure you had like pitfalls and things you had to overcome during that process. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was the first band that I didn't know personally. I'd recorded some of my friends bands. Like, um, I'm not sure if you remember like see you next Tuesday. Mm-hmm. I knew drew for, cause he worked at a lo- local music shop and he grew up with my wife and they went to the same school and they were kind of friends and stuff so i recorded his band there were other bands that i knew in the area just for chicken scratch just like (laughs) sure i'll do your whole album for like a (laughs) hundred bucks you know it's like oh wow what a great deal you know what i mean just like i'm making money doing music yeah i just i've i guess i've always been kind of naively optimistic about this stuff so it never really i just like cool it's i'm actually making some money but it never really hit me in the head until until that moment where this band I didn't know approached me about it. I'm like, oh, okay. So then it was a situation of like, oh, right away is I'm like, yes, this is something that I absolutely want to do as a job. Like, heck yeah, that doesn't feel like a job. That's everyone's dream, right? To somehow get through life pulling in money and not feel like you're working a job. That's really the dream for, I think, everybody, no matter what you want to do or what you're into. So My first thing was, okay, here's the budget. I'm going to blow all of this on gear to make this the best recording I've done to date. Mm. Because if this does well, that's obviously one step towards the next record and the next one and the next one. So I ended up buying some gear from that that I actually still use to this day. Maybe it's just sentimental and and what I'm used to kind of stuff. But it was, was, you know, I, I think I invested that money wisely into setting myself up for future projects. And it was with a, a record label. It was Torque Records, who was, a, I'm not sure if they're still around, but they were like a, a branch off of Victory, uh, Victory Records. Mm. So um, the owner of the label was very impressed for the budget that I was working with and the quality I was doing. So he ended up sending me a bunch of other bands from that. But the thing that, you know, you asked me what I learned from the process. I mean, all kinds, because like I said, when you work with friends, it's different. There's leniences that and social graces you'll expect from working with people you know, right? There's, mm-hmm. yeah, but when someone you don't know, then you're a little more apprehensive. And it's just like, okay, this is more of a formal, you know, project. But at the same time, you know, musicians and artists, we have a lot in common. We think about things in similar ways where most of us, very empathetic about other people's position and, and other people's experiences. So right away, I learned from that that I connect with people uh, pretty pretty easily in, in this field. So so we got along right away. is really great, and we all became really good friends. Immediate, almost immediately, like um, Dave, who was in the band who plays bass, he actually works for Penny Arcade now. I remember, it was, I think it was 2015. This is a good uh, seven, eight years after the recording. He invited me out to their... PAX Expo, which is like this huge video game uh, expo, and it was really cool to meet up with him. I hadn't seen him in years. So made some good friends, um, did a really good album, great band, especially at the time, really good guys. Um, and the label liked it, and the money was good, and it was just nothing but positive. Um, what else did I learn? I was setting up my house for a studio. I was renting a duplex at the time. 
Um, that's obviously presents some challenges with neighbors and stuff. So <laughs> I did a lot of research on noise ordinances, what I'm legally allowed to do, what I'm legally not allowed to do. And sometimes that crosses uh, interests with what the neighbors want to hear <laughs> versus what I'm allowed. Yeah. So there's, you know, I wasn't really the best uh, terms with some of my neighbors, but it's one of those things. Like I, if I'm operating within noise ordinance, I'm not going to sweat it too much, but it was interesting. Yeah, I learned a lot and it really started to snowball because like I said, that label owner liked what I did. The budget was great. There was nothing else, you know, not too many other, you know, producers that were doing records of that quality for that low price in that time. My, my rates have gone up quite a bit since then. But at the time, that was a lot of money. That was like more than what I was making, like at a minimum wage job. And to me, that was, I was in heaven because of it. So I was then, you know, asked to do um, Hester Prince album after that, Great American Beast, um, End of Empires, a bunch of other uh, these, you know, bands on this kind of smaller label with enough of a budget to really keep me going. And 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 again, the more bands I'm working with, the more I'm learning. And yeah, you learn about dealing with people and dealing with expectations. You know what I mean? Because they come to you and there's like a certain expectation, like oh, I want this kind of sound and then my job is like okay what's the reality of your sound versus this last band sound how does that translate what can we do to take the best of that band but like not copy it but like make it your own and 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 what can we explore and what can we experiment with to make your own little cool thing that other bands will say hey that's cool i want to record this guy too but yeah, yeah lots of learning lots of learning and i like what you do with like your uh, i want to say like with your production but with like your your audio elements you know you add this extra stuff into your your music um for example like you did my first single chasing satellites and you you took right. what we created and you added these elements to it just to make it sound more intergalactic if you will you know you took like the <laughs> the idea that Seems we had fitting and, with the name of the song <laughs> right exactly like you just how do these ideas come to you like whenever it comes to that extra element that you add to your production um, well, it really comes from the people. Um, I have many sayings. I like little quotes and little snippets, little phrases to live your life by kind of stuff. Um, well, something that I, that came to me when I was really young that I heard that always stuck with me that life is essentially 10% out of your control and 90% in your control or 10% of the, you know, is the things that happen to you. 90% is your reaction to those things that happen to you. Generally speaking, let's say. So it gave me this sense of when I was a kid of like agency over my own destiny kind of a thing. Um, but to bring this back to um, what you're saying about where do I get these ideas from, um, it's listening to people. And one of my philosophies is a great or a good producer listens to the artist's music. A great producer listens to the artist. Mm. And what that means is you are unique as an artist. Everybody is. Um, so my thing is to, when people are here, I listen, we have a lot of conversation and I try to listen to people and figure out what is it about this person that is unique that we can play up that they might not even know, but because I'm an outside source, I'm the, you know, the artist is the, in the fishbowl and I'm from the outside kind of looking, it's like, okay, what are they not seeing that I can kind of bring out and make them unique? Because your signature, your individuality is your most important thing, I believe, as an artist. And you can be really talented. You can be Bruno Mars and, and have this incredible range. Or you can be Johnny Cash, who has no range. Yeah. The real defining thing, the thing I think that has the most value, isn't just raw ability. It's your uniqueness, your characteristic, your vibe. You know what I mean? Those intangible things that are uniquely you, as opposed to learn through music theory or vocal training, all that kind of stuff. That's what I believe when it comes to music is the true value is the individual. And what can I do to enhance that? So, you know, just, just for my own interest, it makes the records more interesting. Rather than just doing the same record over and over and over again, it's easy to do because you just set up your templates, apply it, and just churn it out like a factory. But that's not inter I'm not interested in doing that or really like contributing to records that sound that way. I like I said, I like focusing on the individual. So when you ask me, where do these ideas come from? Um, yeah, listening to the people I work with and, and trying to figure out what is it that's cool or quirky or things that they might think is a flaw are flaws that are actually cool um, 
characteristics that I can like, oh, let's push this forward. It's like, oh, no, no, I don't want, I, I hate that. It's like, no, 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 trust me, that's really cool. Um, and that's what makes you unique as opposed to, like I said, focusing, oh, I want to play all these drums and I want to do all these guitars or sing all these notes. If it's not your strength, um, don't worry about it because people who've done way less range of singing, way less, way worse lyrics, way <laughs> less drumming have done more things, not because they're better than you, but because they have, um, they haven't been afraid of their own, you know, quirks and stuff and letting those things shine. That's just, I guess, my philosophy on all that. Yeah. And that's a great note for artists out there. You know, it, even myself, like I can take things away from that, you know, don't let your, your flaws get in the way of your creativity. I think that's a huge, yeah. a huge thing that can really help a lot of people. Yeah. And it's, and we're all insecure, especially if, as artists. Like right. I know, I know you're this way. I know I'm this way. I know pretty much all artists are this way. We are, like you said, our worst critics. So we're very self-conscious. We're very sensitive people. So you know what I mean? And that's why we've turned to arts and that's why we look through lenses and, and paint on canvases because we're very sensitive to other people's perspectives and therefore we are very self-conscious about how we come across, you know, and that kind of thing. So we a lot of times mistake flaws for our own eccentric personality traits or artistic traits because, oh, it's not like somebody else that's been super successful. Then you think it's a flaw, Right. Mm -hmm. it's you know and, and some things yeah maybe some things are flaws and things that you can work out to be better but it's tricky it's tricky the 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 lines get blurred a bit when we self-analyze so that's one of my jobs as a producer to see from the outside and say okay this thing yeah i agree this is a flaw maybe you're not so good at this kind of a fill maybe you're not so good at this kind of like range of voice let's just avoid it not to not practice it but when you write music that's not necessarily when practice Yes. Yeah. Oh, how do I want to put this? You know what I mean? Like right. when you write music, it should be executed confidently. Practice Correct. is practice. But when you execute music confidently, that's when your character shows through. Like anytime I'm working with somebody and they're just struggling to hit this high note, I'm like, I don't want to like dash your dreams of hitting this high note. <laughs> but at the same time, it just sounds like you're barely hitting it. Now, sometimes that's valuable. Sometimes you, when you hear a song and someone's struggling to hit a note, that can be very powerful. Uh, but most times it just sounds like you just can't do it and, and you don't, you're not, uh, what's the word? Uh, you're not seeing it or you're not, you don't want to face the reality that you can't hit that note. Right. So my job is like, let's, let's just change the song where you can hit it, you know, confidently. That's when your character shows up, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're playing guitar and like, oh man, he's barely hitting those notes, man, simplify it because then you can put your little spin on it. Then you can put your little sauce on it. But if you're barely hitting the notes, you don't have any time for sauce. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. you're just barely hitting the notes. So it doesn't sound like you. It just sounds like somebody who sucks a guitar. So play to your strengths, simplify it. And then your, your personality is going to shine through the way you bend the note, the way you slide into notes because you can do it confidently, you know? Yeah, and that that also helps with playing live. Like a lot of bands, I think, yes. forget that you got to play these songs live. So if you can't hit that <laughs> note in the studio, you're not like a, a huge example right now. That's I'm on TikTok and there's like a current trend going on on TikTok where there's a Paramore song and you try to hit this note uh -huh. in a Paramore song because Haley doesn't play it live because she's afraid she can't hit that note. And that's like a great <laughs> example of you know, you should play to your strengths because you're going to want to play these mm -hmm. songs live, you know? Yeah. And this is something that we have talks about too. And again, I listen to the artists I'm working with because some of them are like, I don't mind making compromises live. I want the album to be exactly sure. what it is. And then live, I'll worry about it then. And both, both approaches are valid as long as you're aware of it. That's the thing. I always try to make people aware of it. Like a band like Varials, for example, they're yeah. very much a live band. Live, they don't play to clicks. They like to play clicks in the studio, but live, they don't like to use them. They like to have it a little more free form, free floating. Right. That's the way I used to play, you know, which makes me almost feel old just because most bands these days don't. Mm -hmm. They like to play on the grid kind of a thing, and, and I get the benefits of that totally. Um, but it does set them up to not have backing tracks. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't have any extra elements. So you have to write your music to... Again, you know what you know the risk of playing without a click. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of like I said, it's it is playing by the seat of your pants, and that can be a lot of fun. But then, as other bands, you know, that's right for varials, but for other bands, let's say like Lorna Shore, for example, right? There's a lot of production, so you're gonna want to have all the you know without all the orchestral elements and all these other things, it, it might sound a little bare. But that's 
that's your art and that's the way you want to present it. And um, yeah, both both approaches are valid. Just make sure you know what you're doing. So when you're when I when you're struggling to hit this note, I'm talking with somebody. It's like you want to practice a lot before you do that. And they're like, yeah. And I might just change it live, or maybe live will play it, you know, a half step or a whole step lower. Right. I'm like, okay, that's also an option. Um, so th- that's funny because this topic reminds me of another philosophy of mine. When because this is a discussion we have all the time, like. What's the studio album? What's the live version of it? And the way I try to make people think about it is, let's say you're writing a Star Wars, the next Star Wars film. And the plan is you do the film, you make it, and then you're also going to do a Broadway version of it, right? Mm -hmm. The the live version of your film. So what are you going to do? Are you going to compromise all these complex TIE fighter chase sequences in your film because you're going to do a live version of it? Well, no. You're going to do the best version of the film for the theater, and then when it comes time to do a live Broadway tour of it, um, you will you will play to the strengths, which would be, let's say, dialogue between actors, maybe implying some of these things, right? So that's, that's the thing that I try to open up people's minds to in terms of their art, like your album, the digital, CD, vinyl, whatever, you know, the final recorded version of it is one thing. Your live performance of it is and should be something different. Um, it should be obviously you want to play the songs people know and you want them to experience those things live. But see the the strengths and weaknesses of each uh, avenue that you're putting your art into. And don't compromise one for the other because the one is not the other at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you go to see a live thing, you're not – it's not just – the album press play on the loudspeaker (laughs) they're seeing you they're seeing you perform and they're watching you and your body language and this this is something like when i was young and i was this hardcore kid i'm like yeah screw image i don't want i don't care how i dress i'm just gonna wear sandals and cargo pants and i don't give a crap and it's it's this thing with image that i'm putting an image out there just as much as let's say a marilyn manson puts his image out there Mm -hmm. right it's the, the same amount of bandwidth in the human brain is perceiving my image as Marilyn Manson. Now, they're paying more attention to Manson because it looks more less like the average person. So it's a little more of a spectacle. But I'm still putting out an image. My lack of image is just as much my image as Manson's is. So be aware of it. And if your image is just to be a regular person in regular you know, Kmart clothes, that's fine. Just own it. And make sure that you're aware of it, but don't do it ignorantly. You know what I mean? Don't yeah. don't waste the opportunity that you have as an artist to own another aspect of your art and take command of it and be in control of it as opposed to just being ignorant about it. And then your perception by the audience isn't what you think it is. So anyhow, yeah, yeah. Live versus live versus uh, pre-recording is – I like it. I like these kind of topics. It's just It's really interesting because there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot to think about. And there's a lot of stuff that I think a lot of bands don't really like, yeah, fully take advantage of mm-hmm. where they could. Absolutely, yeah. And then can you talk a little bit about uh, how you learned to be a producer? Like, how did you, like, did you, do you have any formal training? Did you go to school? Did, are you completely self-taught? Did you go to YouTube University? Like, how did you learn how to do all this <laughs> stuff, man? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, as a as an engineer, I, I graduated before YouTube University was the thing. Sure. Um, and it's great. It's a great, oh man, it's such a great resource. It's so, there's, the internet is just a wealth of information. Um, when I first started, there was nothing. I mean, it was going to the library. Well, I grew up in a small Mennonite town in Canada, so the library really wasn't much of a help, let alone <laughs> I lived out in the sticks. So, sure. mom and dad, could you drive me 20 miles to the library? Yeah. That wouldn't happen very often. <laughs> and it, even if we went there, there's no resources to, to help me do anything. So right. I'm really kind of on my own. So it was, it was a, um, there was a city, Winnipeg in Manitoba, which is about, I want to say it's about 30 miles or 40 miles from where I grew up. And they had a, a music rental store. You could rent gear, which was really cool. And it was cheap. I couldn't believe how, I mean, especially like now knowing how much that gear was worth, it blows my mind how cheap they rented it out. I was renting like Neumann microphones for a weekend for like 20 bucks. I'm like, this mic is worth $2,000. Um, so I would rent some gear and, um, just experiment. Like I think compressors (laughs) is what I need. I think I need EQs and mics and some, some friend has like an old crappy mixing board and I have this mic and -and so-and-so has this. So I borrow stuff from friends and just experiment. And, um, even with all the information, 
on the planet that we have today, which is amazing. I still firmly believe in also having hands-on experience and that, yeah. the, you know what I mean? Just really, just try, just try it. And just so you know, because you can read about what the effects of a crappy mic through a crappy mixer sound like, but until you hear it, you're like, oh, well, maybe there is some value in this and maybe I can salvage this because I don't have the money for good gear. There is some way to fix this. And my ear is different than yours, is different than everybody else. So maybe there's some stuff about this you like and you can incorporate that into your music. But yeah, I didn't, um, it was all just by the seat of my pants, scraping gear by using crappy PCs. I remember um, the guitarist in my band had a, a 5150 and I remember plugging the line, <laughs> the speaker output into the back of my PC. I'm surprised the thing didn't fry. <laughs> But and it sounded so terrible. But I didn't uh, have a mic to mic it up, and I was like, it sounded like, like bacon frying in a pan. It was so <laughs> awful. The, oh man, there were so so many like just funny, dumb things that you do when you have no exposure to any yeah. information whatsoever. So it took me a long time to to learn it and get good at it. And I wasn't really. It was just kind of like a like I said, just kind of a a ho hum hobby from about you know late '90s up until what was it 2007 is when I did my first band's album. That was the first full length I ever did was my first band's album. Everything else had been singles and EPs and things like that, but like a full actual album that was in 2007. So for about 10 years, it was just you know, just a hobby. Nothing I really took that serious. So when I started taking it serious, then it was like, okay, I would study other records. I would try to, you know, like Kill Switch, um, End of Heartache. I remember that song came out. It was just like, ooh, if you were in the metalcore scene or even around it, to me, that was that whole album was just phenomenal. Mm. Production, songwriting, performance, everything. So I'm like, I'm just going to um, cover this stuff, essentially, and see how close I can make it sound like the original. Because to me, it's like guitar tones, drum tones, everything was sick. So I try to just recreate it. And that's the best way to see the, the tone disparities between your crappy home recordings and Adam D's nice professional recordings. So I'm like, oh, my guitar tone sounds weak. What can I do to fix that? When you're playing the exact same music, that's when the differences really highlight themselves. Mm. So I'd study all these different records, August Burns Red or um, Tool, all kinds of stuff. You know, all these different records that I liked when I was a kid. And I started bringing these out and like, okay, I like the sound of this. I liked Andy Wallace's stuff. What is he doing? So instead of really turning to the internet or the library stuff, I would just look at different records, cover them, study them, see what I can do to emulate these sounds. And I'd also look up different producers and stuff and see what they're doing. And um, and as more and more information started getting onto YouTube, I would definitely look up stuff, miking techniques and, you know, gear review, stuff like that. And you just have to be a sponge, really, you know. Uh, no, but as far as schooling goes, no, I never went to school for it. Hey. I, went to school for I went to school for graphic design, actually, for like oh, well. many years. And I ended up dropping out because it's it's a whole different rant that I could go on about education systems and and, yep. and what they're actually designed to do versus you know what the teachers would like to do or what the students would like yeah. To, yeah that's a whole different rant but long story short i i typically don't recommend most people to go to school for if because i get this asked this all the time where did you go to school da, 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 da. i'm like i don't and i don't recommend that you go to school either because the single biggest thing that you can really do for any i think um especially creative endeavor the best thing you can do isn't schooling or even looking up YouTube stuff or anything on the internet. It is making sure that you have just an unsatiable desire for whatever it is that you do. You can't be taught that in school. And I remember going for graphic design. I was like, there's a lot of people in here that just don't want it. I mean, they, yeah. they major in art, but you can tell from their body language and the, the work that they produce, okay, it's subpar. Why is it? Well, it's clear they don't really care they like the idea of being an artist but they don't actually like making art you know, those are very different things right like i like the idea of being a billionaire <laughs> what okay so then what steps do i need to do to do that well it's a lot you know what i mean there's a lot that has to happen you know what i mean so you have to like the reality of doing what you're doing you know what i mean like uh, like, like art you have to like if you just cannot live without making music and recording and doing production stuff no school is going to give you an advantage yeah unless you're maybe your dream is to work for another studio and maybe you need to learn pro tools a certain way to help out at a 
if let's say if you're doing, I don't know, maybe your dream is to do fully work for some major studio or run a, a studio. You know, there's there's certain things for sure that having a degree, degree can help. But if you're interested in the art of things, and like I said, it, this really goes across a lot of different trades. Um, the best thing you can really, you know, teach yourself is just um, to listen to the things that you really, really want to do, the things that you just can't live without, and just go after that. I mean, I just went after music so hard, I didn't even think about making it a career. It just kind of happened. Yeah. And I think that's just because, like, I was just absorbing myself in it 24-7. I don't have any talent for this stuff. My my ears actually suck. I have terrible tinnitus. Um, some of the best records and some of the records I did that did the best for me, I, I just had horrible cases of allergies where, like, sometimes during the year my ears would plug or one ear would be completely plugged. So my actual like physical hearing isn't actually that good, but it's it's more than that. It's just about you know striving to get it done, because there'll always be obstacles. There'll always be excuses to yeah. why you shouldn't do it or why you can't do it. So the thing to do is, like I said, just um, you know, if you're into the production thing and you just love doing it, just keep doing it. You know, you know, just really focus on it and really focus on improving your craft. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine about something called beginner's novelty. And this is something I think we're all subject to on some level or another. There's something that you like to do and, and you, oh, this is so cool. Um, my own personal example would be shooting on film. I got really into shooting on 8 millimeter film. Uh, it was a couple of years ago. I got a few 8 millimeter cameras and I was messing around. Like, oh, this is really cool. This is like so opposite what digital shooting is. The convenient, you know, it's, it's not convenient. Right. It's so like, <laughs> right. it's so like unpredictable. So much work. And, yeah. And, and a lot of work and expensive. Yep. And the beginner's novelty was discovering it, getting the camera, getting it to work and figuring out how it works, and then producing results. Okay, so going from not doing any film to all of a sudden shooting a music video, I d ended up doing a music video for King yeah. on a couple of years ago, and I was like, this is really cool. So beginner's novelty is like, cool, there it is, and this is cool. But the discouraging next step is, what do I need to do to show an actual improvement over what I just did. That's where beginner's novelty will discourage a lot of people where it's just like, I have a lot of work to do to actually make it, you know what I mean? Cause like I said, going from zero to an actual music video, wow, what a, what a huge feeling and it feels yeah. really good, right? But then what's the next step? Well, a, a marginal improvement over what I just did for a lot of work. And that's the point where I, you feel a little bit discouraged and like, I don't know if I have the um, passion to dedicate the time I need to to actually you know learn film and learn the different lighting conditions and on all and and the exposures and and how to develop and scan and all this kind of stuff and it's just like you know what I had a fun little bit with it and I'll, I'll still you know mess with it from time to time but it's it's it, that beginner's novelty is worn off so and that's something I guess when it, when you talk about education and, and pursuing a career in production that it makes me think about like. Like, you really like it. That's cool. Um, keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And if you can get over that that hurdle of beginner's novelty where you're not making huge strides anymore, but you still love it, then you're really on to something. I think, I think at that point, you're really on to something that you can do for the rest of your life. Because if you're okay with doing photography and you're like, I don't see a huge gain from my, you know what I mean? Again, you go from zero, no doing no photography, to also buying a nice Nikon, whatever, to doing some shots like, wow, this is really cool. Going from zero to that is a huge improvement. Right. Going from those beginner shots to something that's much nicer, mm, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort. So if you can stick through that and get over that hurdle and you don't really think about it, you don't really almost have to consciously do it. You just do it because you love it so much. Then I think you're on to something with your career and it's something you can do the rest of your life and be really, really happy about it. Yeah, you're so right, man. And like, that's that's how it is with most trades you know the more the more passion you put into something the the better you're going to be at it you know and the further you along you'll get with it um yeah. i want to talk a little bit about king uh so you've produced a couple king 810 uh records yes. and yeah just t talk to me about what it's like to work with those guys they their lyrics are you know very hard hitting <laughs> and they they seem to have gone through a lot as a band so what's it like to work with a band like king 810 oh man that's that could be a whole that could be a whole ass episode for <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, um, they are a band that, um, like I said, being involved with the local Michigan heavy music scene, we ended up playing a few shows together. Um, I think our actual last 
show as a band, if I recall, was on a stage that King ended up destroying. So it's kind of <laughs> funny. Um, but I remember um, I knew all the guys in the band that was King before um, David Gunn, you know, came into the picture and and it became you know King as as you know today. Mm-hmm. I knew all those guys. I knew Gene. I knew Beale. I knew Twerk or Andrew Workman. All these all these guys there in the band. I, I knew all of them from different bands that they were in. We played many shows together and you know borrowed gear from each other that kind of stuff but david was always the wild card to me i remember seeing him live and i was like oh, this guy's kind of crazy and then i saw a few festivals we played together i'm like this guy's like you know bashing himself in the face with this microphone and just like just going completely it's like this guy's insane this guy's really crazy and and i have uh like i think a lot of people you have this you know morbid curiosity about when you see a spectacle like that, and it's like like Gigi Allen or something. It's like, what's going on here? Is this guy you know making some kind of a statement, or is it you know pure lunacy? Either way, I'm an entertained kind of a thing. <laughs> so I remember um, being fascinated with the band because I thought the music was really good, and their frontman was just a lunatic. That were like, you would see them live. I would see a lot of heavy bands, and just like, oh yeah, they're good. When you saw King back in you know mid to late 2000s, it was like, oh boy. You don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. A lot of times cops were called, yeah. you know, fireworks thrown to the crowd. Who knows? I mean, it, it was always unpredictable and it could get shut down. It, it, a lot, oftentimes it got violent. So it really felt like a very much a visceral embodiment of heavy music that made most of the heavy bands feel like, you know what I mean? Like you're playing pretend kind of a thing. So right. I was just fascinated by it. Um, but I remember, yeah, playing – Oh, I, yeah, that's right. I remember David posted these big essays on MySpace back in the day that kind of annotated his lyrics wow. for some of these songs. And I remember being just blown away at the amount of thought and detail. He, like, every, every line was, like, time-coded for different events of the story he was telling. It was pages and pages and paragraphs explaining one song and all the details what everything meant. I was just, like, floored. I had never seen especially not from a local band, but like this is something I had never even seen from any major artist ever, like wow. at, especially at that time. Now we have genius, right? Yeah. So we have a place where we can go where people will contribute and like show what means what means what. So he was doing this back then. I was just like, holy wow. cow, this guy is like seriously on a whole different level when it comes to his storytelling. And it was so like authentic. I was like, this guy has definitely been through some stuff. So fast forward a few years later, we had – um they were managed by somebody that I knew known from a, who managed some other band. And I'm like, Oh, if she's managing them, they can't be that wild and out of control when it comes to the business side of things. So I don't think they're going to trash my duplex if we decide to work <laughs> together. So we arranged to do a couple of demos and this is around the time that they started getting some serious attention from major labels, um, Roadrunner and Warner brothers proper. Their parent label was also interested in Sony and, Nuclear Blast. I mean, you name a big label. Back in 2013, um, they were all chasing them, and it was they came out to do some demos, and you know, A and R guy after A and R guy from all these big labels were showing up to our demo you know, wow. uh, recording session. It was kind of like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. And um, yeah, I remember working the first time I worked the first time I hit record with David Gunn. Um, was Fatter on the Heart, the demo of it. He did the whole song in one take and was talking shit in between takes when there was no vocals. <laughs> I grew up in a church on Sunday. Back again, barely friends on Monday. They don't just die, they are killed from the gunplay. Or the heroin, or a prison say. Did the whole song one take, first time through. I was like, wow, this wow. <laughs> this guy is on something. And we ended up using, I want to say I ended up using most of that in the final you know, wow. release of the song just because it had such an energy to it that you just can't recreate. Um, but it's like, yeah, this guy, I remember talking to him too about like, this is before any of the, the label guys started showing up. I'm like, so what's the plan of this stuff? He's like, well, the smallest label I'm willing to sign to is Runner. I'm like, wow, okay. So you're setting your sights pretty high. And and that was something that I definitely learned. One many things I've learned from this guy is is just, um, yeah, one of those things is really setting your expectations and really valuing yourself. And, and I think a lot of artists, like I said, about second guessing yourself, or a lot of that comes to the value of the art that we put out there. 
that we undervalue it because a lot of bands like, oh, I wish I could sign to this tiny label, that tiny label. I'm like, that's cool. Um, why not think bigger? I mean, a lot of the stuff is worth, you can be worth more than that. And I think, but if you set yourself up to your goal is this tiny little label, well, you're kind of like stunting yourself and throwing a, right. you know, a stick into your spokes because you've set yourself up to shoot for such a low bar. Not that it's, I don't want to say some of the small labels are low bars, but like when you set yourself that to be the maximum of your potential, I think you're crippling yourself. And that's something that working with David right away is I could tell this guy is not setting any <laughs> obstacle in front of himself at all. He is shooting for all the biggest possible targets kind of a thing. And um, yeah, you'll miss a lot of them, but again, it's, uh, yeah, no, it's, it sets yourself up to do, to do better things for sure. But anyhow, getting back to working with them. Uh, yeah, it was really, man, there's, there's a million stories I could tell. I could, you know, I could talk about, you know, him pepper spraying himself when we were recording vocals just because what? he figured it would give himself more intensity when he did what? kill them all. Oh my, yeah, it, wait, for real? Yeah, yeah. They, wow. they ended up put, if you go to their, the King810 YouTube channel, um, he's got, they put up like these King TV episodes and I kept bugging. I was like, dude, you got to put up the video of you pepper spraying yourself when we did, you know, kill them all. So yeah, went to the bathroom, had G spray him in the eyes with pepper spray. And then he just crawls into the vocal booth and did kill them all. Did most of the song, but the thing with pepper spray and doing vocals is yes, it hurts, but the big problem is it takes your breath away. It's really hard to breathe. Right. So when you're going hard, it's just you need a lot of air. So that was a problem. After the first verse, he just started choking up. So then I remember getting a big bowl of milk and he's ducking his head in this bowl of milk <laughs> and then took about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then did the rest of the song and then did five more songs the same day. Wow. He's just red in the face, just burning up. And then the next day he's like, I'm like, yeah, you ready to do more pepper spray? I was joking. Like, oh, yeah. So he sprays this big towel full of pepper spray and just rubs his face. And I'm just like, oh, my God. It's like, you're insane. But that's the thing. Like this, you know, the thing that you learn from working with somebody like that is just realizing that they will, they are just willing to do anything. Mm. Oh, yeah. He, he also ate a bunch of like Serrano peppers, too, before he did that. <laughs> he, was, he had the, If you look at the video, you can see he's got a plate full of Serrano peppers. He's eating the seeds, the whole deal. We bought them from Meyer and... <laughs> Um, man, there's, there's a million stories that I could, I could tell you about that. But, um, as far as like working with, uh, King, yeah, it's, um, it's, you know, it's, it's no secret, you know, David is the, the, the driving force, the creative force behind that band, you know, uh, from the moment, from really, really from, uh, the Midwest Monsters first EP going forward, mm -hmm. because if you look back to like some of the stuff they did. Let's say with Jason Hale from uh, Chiotis when he was in the band. Right. It was very much music focused at that point. It was riffs, guitars kind of stuff. And David, I remember talking actually with, with this a few weeks ago, and he's like, during that period, it was very much music over like riffs and stuff over the substance of the band. And once Jason left, they did a bit of a retooling, and it was like, we're going to be more focused on the message, the vocals, and right. that kind of thing. Like like any big band, right? You know what I mean? Like, like Paramore. Like it's, you know, the focus here is on Haley's, you know, lyrics her performance right her as really the the leading actor in this film that is paramore right like she's the star of this thing mm -hmm. and that's how you get people to connect to it the personality of it so that's what he decided to do is retool it and then from there on forward it's been you know essentially the david gunn show in terms of you know what the storytelling is really what the music does you know he he, do, he also does write a lot of music and you know a lot of the guitar stuff too Wow. And, you know, we do a lot of collaboration on things. And what I like working with him is that really no genre is, is off limits. It's I write right. a lot of different stuff and I'll show him some stuff. He's like, hey, this is cool. We could use this for something or, you know, use this for that. And, you know, it's 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 just funny how these things, you know, end up working out. And some stuff that I'll think is like maybe throwaway material. And this happens with a lot of bands that I'll – because I do a lot of writing with bands – I do a lot of writing on my own, and some sometimes I'll have these things that I think suck, and some bands like, no, 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 this is cool. We can a little tweak here and there, and all of a sudden it's it's something else. Like the song, you know, let's say Alpha and Omega, yeah. that was a track that I had written with um, 
Maddie Montgomery in mind because he was in my old band and he talked to me. He's like, let's do some rap metal project. I'm like, cool. So I wrote a few tracks and that was one of them. And I just been sitting on them for years at this point. And I remember when we were doing the La Petite record, you know, it was a situation where the band had no time to do any writing. So when it came time to studio time, we're like, okay, we'll just do all the writing in the studio. And we were hitting a brick wall and David's like, well, do you have any stuff? Any things laying around that you're not using? I'm like, well, let me just comb through some things. And that was one of the things that stuck out to him. It was just this little riff thing that I had put together and, and then, you know, the band flushed the rest of it out and there it is. It's a song that, you know, it's, it's funny. And it's like, they hear the potential of that. And I remember hearing that song and, and, and just trying to figure out what we could, you know, cause sometimes I'll, you know, give David some ideas for songs. Most of it, he comes up on his own. I'd say like 99% of it, but every once in a while I'll be like, you know, I think it was like, uh, Jesus had just come out and, and we were just really feeling it. And I'm just like, we need a King song that is the, the, it's the King equivalent of I am a God, but you yeah. know, the Kanye song. I'm like, Okay, that was pretty much all I told him, and he just ran with that, and that's where Alpha and Omega came from. Wow. It was kind of like inspired by that empowering vibe of feeling, you know, like a god, you know what I mean? And and just the the feeling of that whole record and, and what a huge shift that was just in music in general, you know, not even rap, but just music in general. That was such a huge landmark item, you know, for all of us. Bitch, I am the powers that be. I am Christ crucified on the tea. So but, crazy. Yeah, it's like I said, it, it's funny. Like this is that's just one example of how working together, certain things will you know come together. Mm. Um, yeah, I love I love working with um, you know the guys in King and you know, especially David. Like I said, he's he's you know you know creative genius. You know, a true artist to me. Like there's a lot of us that we like playing with instruments, we like doing things. But that dude's an artist. He does. You know, he directed the Alpha and Omega video. Right. He directs, he's been directing videos. I think, oh, I forget what the first one was he directed, but it was some stuff with memoirs. But yeah, insane eye for cinematography, storytelling. Um, yeah, just a, just a really great person to work with and learn a lot from because he's, you know, we're definitely very different people, you know, because when you, when you think of King, a lot of people think of bolstering and, 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 you know, you know, bullshit stories and stuff like that. Mm. But um, knowing the band and growing up, you know, near Flint, playing shows around there and stuff, yeah. it's just like, it's it's very real. And if anything, downplayed in a lot of ways to um, not incriminate themselves, let's put it that way. Um, but it's kind of funny because the rest of the world's like, oh, no, no, they're making it up. It's like, well, I guess I can kind of see that because most bands are fantastical when you think about it. Right. You know, like a band like Lorna Shore, it's not, Real. I mean, it's based on real events, but a lot of it's 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 drummed up to be like dramatic, like mm-hmm. like most things, right? Like most entertainment, it's it's better when you you know you embellish a little bit and stuff. And not that King doesn't, but it's it definitely comes from a very real place of real experience. And to me, that it's it was obvious from the beginning. But it's it's kind of funny. I guess I suppose if you're not exposed to those kind of things, yeah, um, you might think that it's made up, but. Yeah, if you've yeah. if you've never experienced Flint, Michigan, like of course you're gonna think that these things are fantastical. But I mean, if you've ever been there, like you know, I've been through the Machine Shop, you know, and that's like one oh, of my yeah, favorite one venue. of my favorite venues, you know. And I've got I bought a hoodie from there because I was like, I love yes. this place so much. Every band has been here. <laughs> this is awesome. But yeah, if you've never experienced Flint, Michigan, like you know, when you hear King Eight Ten and you actually do go experience Flint, like you can put the pieces of the puzzle together for sure. Yeah, it seems so obvious to me, but I try to think again. I try to think from other people's perspective because right. my first thing is like, like, oh man, you're just a hater. But it's like, ah, oh, well, I can kind of see it because if you've never really seen this stuff, you've never really been in some of these, you know, war zone neighborhoods. Essentially, right. like, you would never get why the these kind of lyrics, why these kinds of stories are so integral to that. You know, just the sound of the band and the identity of the band. But so you went to the machine shop. Were you there to watch a band or did you did you so play there? So I was on tour. So I was on tour as a videographer ah. for a band that went through there. Uh, it was Escape the Fate and Hell Yeah. Nice. And uh, oh, so cool. they, they went through the machine shop. And so we got to, I flew my drone around Flint a little bit. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, I'll I got f- to, I got to see a little bit of it. And, uh, you know, it's a very fascinating place for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's not, you know. 
Flint isn't all doom and gloom. There's a lot of really right. nice parts of the city, a lot of really cool innovation going on, a lot of mm -hmm. people doing some great things. But you know, there's also a really you know scary part of it, a really sad yeah. part of it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's just it's just a, a microcosm of a lot of things going on in the country. It's 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 really it's really fascinating. So so you were there. That's really cool. And um, yeah, Machine Shop, phenomenal venue. The sound. I've played on a lot of different stages over the years, but my God, the sound as a drummer playing on stage was just so good. Yeah. It's just, just the best sound possible. I've seen a few different bands there. Like, I think the last band I saw there, you know, was Devin Townsend and like Tesseract and stuff, and it was just Ooh. insane. Tesseract, the sound guy that runs that place. I don't know God. his name, but dude, he's so good. He's such a phenomenal sound guy. Man. So let's talk about uh, switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about international bands like In Hearts Wake. Yeah. So you've done a couple oh, yeah. things with In Hearts Wake, and I lived in Australia, so of course I know who they are, oh. and I love, I love their music. So it was so cool to see that you got to work with them. Um, how did they find you? How did you guys get connected? Um, yeah, that was. Um, I'm trying to think of the albums that probably convinced them to come over, if I remember correctly. It was probably. I know one of them was Legend Pale Horse. Yeah. That was one that they liked a lot. And I think the other one was a plea for purging's life and death of. And that was another album. Like between those, like one can be a fluke. One can be just the band telling you what to do and you just listening really well. And But if you can do two that are really solid from two, you know, fairly different bands, and it's like, okay, so this guy must have the juice and he's able to, you know, you know, do something good with good material. So, yeah, they got a hold of me and... I remember hearing the demos and they were phenomenal. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't a whole lot of change that happened in the studio in terms of song arrangement or mm. stuff like that or, or, you know, lyrical content. Not, not a lot of it changed from the demos that I, that I showed, that I was shown. I remember like, he was like, man, man, this is like, this is really like at the time forward thinking in terms of, you know, the messaging forward right. thinking in terms of the songwriting and structure. And yeah, the demos are really solid. I'm like, this is really, really cool. So yeah, they came out and they stayed with my in-laws at the time. And which actually my father-in-law has been housing bands ever since I started. Wow. Um, this is a bit of a side story real quick. But yeah. when I first started, bands would come out and they would crash at my uh, duplex where my wife and I were living. And that gets old really quick. And but b before it got old for us, it got old for my landlord, who was like, "Yeah, this in is not happening. <laughs> You're not having people <laughs> crash here." So I'm like, "Crap! What am I going to do? These guys are all from Ohio. They you know can't just you know they do get a hotel. They can't afford that. Right, like right. this budget is shoestring enough as is." So my in laws are like, "Oh hell no! They're going to stay with us." And so for the last what would that be now? A 10, 11 years. Um, my mother in law has since passed away, but my father in law has kept up you know housing bands at his place. He loves having them over there and. If I ever got the inclination that he was getting tired of it, I would not even offer it to anybody. But he seems to really enjoy the company, and he likes the music. I mean, the, the bands get a kick out of it because they, when they stay there, it's like, yeah, we woke up, and he was like, Blasting King. <laughs> <laughs> so he genuinely really enjoys it. He's just wow. the, the most genuine, kind person I think I've probably ever met in my life. And just the most hospital. You cannot ask for a better person to host these bands because he's just the most selfless person wow. in the world and really enjoys it now with everything going on right now and he's had some health issues so that's obviously off the table for the time being but right uh anyhow you were asking about yes about in hearts wake so when they came out they would stay with my they stayed with my in-laws and they just fell in love with them and the feeling was mutual they so they really connected and since they weren't able to drive out here, we had to shuttle them back and forth. So it was a bit of an ordeal, but it was like, you guys are making the trip from Australia, and you know what I mean? This is a decent budget record, so let's let's make this happen. You know, whatever, you know, well, yeah, let's, let's just do it and, and make it happen. So the first record we did together was Divination, and um, they were independent at the time. But I think they, they had some label interest for sure. Um, and by the time it was done, we ended up shopping around and I know Rise was really interested in them and Unified and they really wanted Unified just because Rise out here, if they were American, obviously Rise would have more sure. reach out here, but in Australia, Unified's you lived there. in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So Unified is a much bigger deal for them. 
so that's why they ultimately you know you know went with them and uh record did really well so then i think it was like about a year and a half later you know back again and jake was toying with me about the idea of doing i was like yeah we have like 18 songs and he's like maybe we could write a few in the studio and and, and maybe we could do a double album i'm like screw it let's 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 try it let's at least try it if, at worst case scenario we'll have a few extra songs that you can use as bonus material or whatever right so when they came out the second time they were here i want to say for seven weeks maybe eight and yeah we just ended up writing i want to say four or five songs together and 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 it turned into this double album that was a lot of work i mean that's yeah you're talking 20 was it 22 songs 24 songs i can't remember right. if it's 11 or 12 songs on each record but yeah, that was a lot of work. And it was, I remember being really stressful. I remember my mother-in-law was going through health issues. My wife had some health issues. She had a broken leg. It was it was surrounded with a lot of stress. And um, I think, you know, the relationship between Jake and I kind of deteriorated a little bit during that process that I felt bad about because there was just a lot of, I think, miscommunication and things going on. So making that record was a lot of fun, but it was also really stressful. And I think it brought out a lot of some of these issues. So when they did the next record after that, they decided to go to Will Putney and work with him. They did ARC with, with him. And I think mm -hmm. Will actually ended up going to Australia because they wanted to try that because flying out here again, it's just like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So then after that, they're like, let's – we ended up reconnecting through – they did a cover. Uh, it was a compilation for Silverchair. And Silverchair is like one of my favorite bands growing up. I love that band. And they're obviously from Australia, so they're a really huge deal. Uh, down there so they were doing this silver chair was getting inducted to the australian rock and roll hall of fame or, so they're going to have this compilation to coincide with that and then they wanted they're going to do a cover of freak and then they wanted me to mix it i'm like cool great you know we'll work again with each other but this was like done remotely so we just kind of like talked and you know reconnected exchanging ideas about how to properly approach the song and try to do it justice and stuff so with that it kind of just rekindled our you know you know, and just we hadn't talked to each other in, in years, and we all had kind of grown and matured over that time. So it was it was really cool to like reconnect. Like me with the rest of the guys, always cool. But I know me and Jake kind of butted heads a little bit on those la on that double album project. So it was really nice to like reconnect and like you know, in effect, mend some of these you know you know damages <laughs> let's yeah, say that yeah. sometimes happen. So it was really, really, really cool. And then, um, yeah, and then Jake came out, just him and I, and we ended up writing a bunch of songs together for Kaliuga, the next record. And because he was in the States living out here in L.A., he was dating um, Georgia Flood, and she's an actor, and she's she's been in a bunch of TV shows and stuff. So it's interesting because his mom is also an actor. So it's kind of funny oh, how wow. these things <laughs> kind of line up. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Jake was living in L.A., so it was really easy for him to come out over here and 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 collaborating on some songs so it was just so great to like reconnect and spend some time and like realize that these silly things in the past are just so insignificant and and uh really reconnect and 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 just you know kind of like fall in love with the process of working together again and and collaborating on some things so it was just so much it was just really really nice working with the guys again on this new record we tried all kinds of cool stuff and it was just because they came along at a really integral part in my career like i was doing some good stuff like i said i'd just done a plea for purging i just done stuff with legend and those are like you know let's be honest relatively speaking those are pretty small bands but there's still enough budget to like it pays the bills for sure but i remember very distinctly when in hearts wake first came out i was just strapped for cash and i convinced uh jake to pay for the album up front you know right around when we were starting and thankfully he did it helped me out a lot so we definitely have a lot of history together of, you know, working together and, like I said, helping me out in those, you know, situations and stuff. So I value their friendship, you know, immensely, especially Jake. Jake is the David Gunn of that band. He's another mm -hmm. visionary kind of guy with um, an insane work ethic, um, just a great human being, a really championing a really great cause. Um, just thinking about all the details and all the aspects of his art and how to use it in the most effective way possible. And yeah, he's just one of these guys that's just always thinking about different angles and how to improve things and make things better and really pushing the bands to just perform at a level that most people would just never be able to like get themselves to do. But when you have someone motivating like he does, yeah, he's 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 a driving force, absolutely, in that band. They're really just 
a credit to the music scene. Absolutely. I, I love Jake Taylor. Great guy. Absolutely. And so what have you been doing during 2020? Uh, we've been kind of locked in our houses and you work yeah. from home. So I'm sure you adapted yeah. pretty quickly to this whole pandemic situation. Um, yeah. I know that uh, you've got that band Tala. Is that how you say their name? Tala. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I just watched LED. You posted it up on Facebook and I was oh, like, cool. oh my God, this band, <laughs> what? <laughs> you seem to find like these bands seem to come to you and just they're, they're always so impressive. So tell me a little bit about what you've been doing during 2020. Yeah. Um, and you just said it, uh, you, you said you find these bands and then you said these bands come to you. You're absolutely right. I'm, I'm so fortunate at this point that these bands do find me and it's because of this snowball effect, right? You do this band and this mm -hmm. band and, and other bands like this band. And then, you know what I mean? And Varios comes to me because they like these bands and now bands come to me because the Varios record. So it all snowballs and it all like, it all builds on itself and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Tala. Great. I mean, I'm not sure how much you know about that band, but they're really an interesting collection of characters. Um, Justin, their vocalist did a lot of like, vocal covers and like right. tutorials and stuff on YouTube. He kind of made a name for himself on YouTube as this kind of YouTube guy. And now he's like in his own band. And then Max Portnoy, everybody knows that, you know, if you know who the name Portnoy, you know that his dad is Mike Portnoy. Yeah. And um, it was great working with him. And, and I tried not to punish him too much or family too much because <laughs> as a drummer, yeah, you'd have to be living under a rock not to know who Mike Portnoy is. And right. he's legendary. And it's you always feel a little bit apprehensive working with somebody who's related to such such an iconic figure. Like, like how what's you know what I mean? I think he'd be jaded about it. No, he's super cool. He loves his dad. Super proud of you know you know everything he's accomplished and stuff. And it's just it's awesome. He's just a great person. And he brought in a lot of his dad. Like I think he he took his dad's double bass pedal and a bunch of his cymbals and stuff. I'm like this is crazy. This is like some like prototype Sabian stuff. I was like this is very very cool. But he's very different than his dad. He's he's not trying to emulate his dad's style. He's got his mm. own his whole own thing going on. Right. And it's uh yeah, it was great working with him. He's got a great um a great ear for the uniqueness of drums. Not so much, you know, on the technical side of things, more on like the attitude, the aggression of things and and just the ferocity of, you know, new metal. And it's kind of funny like I always love Corn Life is Peachy. That was like one of my favorite albums growing up. It's kind of like this you know, the unloved uh, child of Korn's discography. And that was an album he loved too. So we were always connected on that and like the sounds of the drums and all this kind of stuff and how we can like take inspiration from that. So great guy to work with. And Justin is, I remember working, <laughs> I, I got some good stories about them. When Justin first showed up, he talked to me in this like very convincing English accent for like half an hour, <laughs> right away. So I'm like, oh, this guy's English. I, I thought he was like, I saw some of his YouTube videos. Okay, never mind. So I just didn't question it. And then also he switched. He, this dude definitely beats to the, you know, walks to the beat of his own drum. Um, and I remember asking, because I'll talk to people like, what are your influences? I'm curious to know who influenced you and, and how we can, you know, either play those up or try not to lean them too much because you don't want to sound like a ripoff either. Yeah. And I'm like, who are your influences? And most, you know, people who do screaming and singing will list, you know, the typical people you'd think of. But he's like starts listing off Disney villains. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I like this a lot. This is cool. Sick. You know what I mean? So he's he's thinking about his art in a really interesting angle that most people don't. Yeah. So and then, yeah, and then the other gu guitarists in the band and and their DJ, uh, everybody. There's there's so much such a great collection, and I could go on and on about just this band alone. But I want to get back to your topic about. We're at home. So yeah, working from home is yeah, it's 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 tricky for a lot of people. And I think one of the reasons that I like audio production versus playing in a band is that I'm kind of a hermit. So mm -hmm. self isolation is to me is that's my lifestyle. Right. <laughs> that's that's what that is what I like about my work is being isolated and not leaving the house for sometimes a week at a time. <laughs> That's just I just always kind of been that way. So when I did the touring thing, I, I found myself. What do we talk about? Beginner's novelty. Yeah, yeah. it was that. It's like cool. On the road, I'm seeing all these cities and eating all this great food, and then very shortly, I'm like, yeah, I just want to go back home. <laughs> I yeah, just wanna, yeah, I just want to go back home. So for me personally, the novelty of that wore off very quickly. Um, but yeah, working from home, I love it. I've been doing a lot of yeah. When it first happened and this whole pandemic thing happened, I'm like, oh man, what are, what are we going to do? Like, it's new to everybody. How do we 
how do we best handle this situation that's best for everybody and safest for everybody? And, and so I end up moving a lot of projects around. I end up having a band quarantine here with me in the studio. And, and it, it, we try, you know, just trying a bunch of different things, um, you know, taking as many safety precautions as possible, you know, shifting a lot of this stuff to remote sessions, mm-hmm. which is something that I've thought about doing for years. But, you know, Instead of like, typically I'll take on like with you, like mixing and mastering, where it's typically done mostly just with email. Rarely right. will I even get on the phone with bands because I think most people just prefer written communication. It's easier to just reference when it's convenient for you. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of like write things out a little better or like include links to different songs. Like we want it to kind of sound like this or we want to take this idea and match it with this kind of thing. And this is the kind of guitar tone we're looking for. Okay, cool. It's easier for you to just show me an example maybe than even tell me. Um. But what I've been trying to do with some of these remote production things is get more on the phone with people and talk to them more often because I think that's where one of my strengths, like I talked about, kind of comes through is is talking to people and getting the tone because, you know, through text you can only get so much because, you know what I mean, what we want to communicate and what we actually communicate are sometimes two different things. True. Like just me being on this podcast. What I'm saying in my mind is one thing, but the way – it ends up coming out and the way you interpret it at the other end sometimes can be very different. And a lot of times that's subconscious. Like it could be the speed at which I'm talking or the tone of voice I'm using for different topics. Like subconsciously and maybe a Freudian way, I'm saying something without realizing it. And this is something I try to tap into when I talk to people. It's like, oh, I love this band. I love this band. These are my biggest influences. I'm like, that's interesting because the way you talk about this other band that you think is maybe embarrassing to like, you have a different tone of voice that made, makes uh, me think you actually like them more. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's the difference. That's the difference between uh, written communication and actually hearing each other talk. So that's Very true. with these remote production things. I try to have more conversation with the band to kind of you can get more into the truth. I think of the matter of where the influences are, what they really like, not what they think is cool to like, or you know that kind of thing. Because I'm of the mindset. There's no such thing as a guilty pleasure, as long as it doesn't harm somebody else, right? True. No such thing as a guilty pleasure if it's if it doesn't harm anybody, and and you know it's whatever you 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 like or into whatever band or whatever it is that influences you as an artist. Don't feel guilty about it. Mm. Like I said, as long as it's you know not harming anybody else, but use that and don't feel guilty about it. I don't care if you know you're a metalcore band and your biggest influence is I don't know the theme from. Boy Meets World. Okay. Sure. So that's funny, but like, what is it about that that we can tap into? You know what I mean? It's mm. it's one of those things. And yeah, like, yeah, the, 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 that's, I guess, a big thing about the production side of stuff that I think is just immensely important is, like I said, listening, li- listen to the artist's music. Most importantly, though, listen to the artist. Where are they coming yeah. from? What is the, what are they actually trying to do? What are the things that they're trying to do that they didn't even realize they're trying to do? But when you talk to them, you're like, oh. So you almost have to kind of play this like musical therapist in some ways where like like I like to get to know people pretty personally. Like I think that every band that comes through my studio doors, if especially if they're here for a record that's like a month long, we leave pretty close friends. Like we've had a lot of discussion about stuff that's not music related. But And I find myself like it's a win-win scenario, right? Like you gain a friend, but at the same time, if I'm friends with you, I'm going to be more compelled to do you right and make sure that the album yeah. that we do together does well for you. Like I, I take a personal investment in that. So sometimes it's, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to not take it personally. You know what I mean? When things, you know, go sour or if a band goes to another producer, I'm like, man, what did I do wrong? You know what I mean? Like, And you have to <laughs> kind of separate yourself from that because, well, you know what I mean? There's there's a million different ways to tackle music and and your way while you are trying your best someone else might have a good, you know, an advantage that you don't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, anyhow, yeah. When it comes to this, you know, working from home thing, figuring out ways to keep the conversation going and still having communication with the artist to me is very important. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. And then we talked a little bit about how your rate has changed from where you started, obviously, which is how it should happen as a freelancer. So how long did it take for you to find your value and your worth? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> that's a that's a philosophical question, isn't it? When you yeah, really think about a little it, bit. a lot of people do struggle with that. Like, what is if I ask you, what is your value and what is your worth? Not in monetary terms, but they are related psychologically, right? Yeah, I I've always been one of those people that like, 
there's something called the Dunning Kruger effect. Have you heard of this? Uh, I I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I've it's, heard it by name, but I might know what it is. It's 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 a theory, and I'm just summarizing. Um, in that a lot of people um, over you you typically fall into a camp of overestimating or underestimating your intelligence or worth or whatever it is. Mm. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's people that you know. I mean, you um, let's say you have a competence in a certain field, but you really downplay it because you just second guess yourself. So that you're a, you're a, you're a victim of that Dunning Kruger effect. You know what I mean? Like you're actually more competent at this than you really realize. Yeah. Oppositely, a lot of people will be like, Oh, I'm really good at this thing when you're really not at all. <laughs> and mm-hmm. you're also uh, subject to the Dunning Kruger effect. It's essentially, I think just most people really on one side or the other side of the coin kind of either overvalue or undervalue themselves. So I think I definitely fall into the category I did into undervaluing you know, what I was doing. Right. I think it's one of those things. I think it's just, you know, maybe it's a, uh, you know, history, let's say of, you know, self-esteem issues will play into that. Right. I mean, sure. it's all connected. So what is my value as a photographer? Like, well, you know, my stuff's okay, but this person is so much better and that person's so much better. So my yeah. stuff is like, oh, I, you, this is something that any freelance artist is going to struggle with. Like what is, the actual value of this work that you're doing. It's tricky and it's going to vary project to project and stuff like that. I'm at a point now where it's just like I make a comfortable living doing art and Mm -hmm. I can make more or less. I would still be fine. Um, And that's the thing. You get to a certain point too where like not that money isn't an object, but it gets to the point where like money can come and go. It doesn't really affect your fundamental happiness anymore. So then you have to be like, okay, you have to kind of face yourself a little bit more. I think a lot of people struggle with that. Like they chase money so much with their art that when they finally do get that money, they're like, hmm, I'm still fundamentally unhappy with myself, yeah. even though I'm making five times the rate that I thought was great. So, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff. It's an interesting question. What do you do to find that rate? I don't think you ever do. I, I don't think you ever do find that, that that balance. You're constantly, you know, readjusting it, Yeah. You know? And, and you should to, be trying to find a good balance. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you do that. I can't think of any producer or anybody involved in any freelance work that isn't constantly reevaluating their their rates. Like, oh, maybe I'm charging too much, or maybe I'm charging too little, or maybe I, maybe this project I can get away with charging less because I think it'll be less work. Or this one's like they're asking me my rate for this project when they know full well this is going to be way more work <laughs> than, yeah, than yeah. this other thing they're referencing. Right. You know, it's it's one thing to like. Hey, can you just like like just I want a property shot. Okay, cool. I can just show up with my drone and get a little like pan up. Cool. Yep. Hey, I want you to do a music video. Okay, well the <laughs> very different involved task here. It's not gonna be the same rate. Exactly. It's like, oh, but you only charge this person this much. It's like, yeah, but this is a very mm, more anyhow, intricate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's there's a lot that goes into it. And as a freelancer, yeah, you definitely know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's it's a constant uh you know, changing of pace, right? And it depends on your, it, I'm not living in the duplex anymore. I bought a house and stuff and I have a, a studio with a good amount of square space now. So you have more overhead. So your rates kind of have to reflect that a little bit, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I don't want to use the word constant struggle because that sounds negative. It's a constant reevaluation there of, you go. of your own worth and you know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. You know, I love that you, you, said it just how any other freelancer should be looking at it you know you should always be constantly reevaluating what you're charging and seeing what your competition or your colleagues are charging and and kind of work around it that way um and then my last question for you is what is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started Hmm. well there's definitely a few things hmm what's the thing i wish i knew now (laughs) <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of practical things. Hmm. That's an, I have to think about that one for a second. That's the one that gets everybody. It's my favorite question. <laughs> yeah. What is, what's the one thing I know now that I wish I would have known when I started? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't want to come across as being too complacent or just, too overwhelmingly happy with the decisions I made, but I, I do feel pretty, you know, pretty good about most everything. Um, 
what I, I mean, there's like I said, there's a lot of stuff just techniques wise, just basic things like that. Um, hmm. At the risk maybe of sounding too negative, I have maybe a lot of personal uh, poor experiences with mm, management types. Mm. People that come in to skim a little bit off the top that maybe don't add a whole lot to it. And there are some good managers out there, for sure. But I've had a lot of experiences where I trusted some people to have the same um, good interest, not only of my own, but the bands I was working with. And then you get betrayed by that. And it's just like, yeah, I really wish I wouldn't have trusted them with this you know, type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to, like I said, at the same time, you know, it's like, what, what's the lesson there? To be more guarded, to be more less trusting of people? I don't know. I mean, nothing devastating has happened. You know what I mean? Like I, I, like I said, I feel like I'm a pretty optimistic person. And I do like to trust people and give people the benefit of the doubt. Even if I deal with, like I say, managers or even record labels that are greedy or do shady things that yeah. aren't right mm-hmm. to the band or, or, or to me personally. Um, sticking up, you know, for bands or sticking up for what's right. Sometimes, you know, you find yourself you know, rolling over in a situation where you feel like you should be standing up for something. Um, you know, it's, yeah, there's, yeah, there's some things that <laughs> I definitely don't want to, you know, share in, you know, for sure. in terms that could oust certain people, but right, right. Um, I'm trying to think of, yeah, the, I'm just trying to think of the, the most stressful situations I've had in terms of the studio and what would have made those things better. And, like seriously 99% of that stuff isn't the the band themselves it isn't the artist it isn't like disagreeing about some musical thing it was typically an outside force let's say like a record label dragging their feet in terms of payment Mm. or Mm -hmm. being nasty in emails when there's really no need for it you know what I mean it's just like if I'm asking for something a simple no that's out of the budget or no we can't do that is is fine but then some people turn nasty really quickly and it just it makes you want to like well okay now we're putting up drawing lines and when we should be in the same team yeah, and managers and stuff like that. So typically the, my worst experiences in music typically have been due to uh, record label incompetence or malice even, or managerial incompetence or malice. So, so then I think what is the, what is the lesson that, to learn there? Again, like I said, I don't want to say don't trust people because that's, that's not a good, you know, that's, that's, I don't believe in that at all. Right. Be more guarded. I don't know if I, 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 I don't know if I really believe that either. I think it's just, um, mm, be more realistic about expectations or perspectives, and realize that even though you are emotionally invested in this album, the manager won't be, the label won't be. You know what I mean? So sometimes, the, you know, things will come across as, as maybe more callous than what you think they are because you are so emotionally invested in this record. And then you get some kind of response or it's treated with such, you know, it's kind of discarded and you feel like personally offended. So, yeah. Yeah, keeping, you know, not to be less emotional about the work that you work on, but try to realize that maybe the person that's running the record label, the person that's the manager isn't exactly in a, in a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a career of passion compared to you or the artist that you're working with. So I, I, that's to me where conflict rises up. And like I said, when you said, what do you wish you knew now that you knew back then? The first thing I thought is like, how do I eliminate any stresses or negativities mm. or things like that? And so I'm like, cause most of it, it's been really positive. It's, I've learned a lot. I've learned from a lot of artists. Like I try to, one of my philosophies is always, I don't care. Like, cause you'll take on projects, you know, I think we can be, we can be safe admitting this. We can, t- we sometimes pay, take on projects that maybe we shouldn't have either. Yeah. We were too busy or the, the, the project itself was like, I don't know if I'm necessarily on board with either the creative vision or just the ta- honestly, the talent level of the individuals getting a hold of me. Yeah. But I'm just going to do it anyhow because well, it's, I still like my work and it's easy money and I have bills to pay <laughs> and I have a hole in my schedule that needs filling and there's nothing else right now. So sometimes you'll take right. on these projects that you're like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that or, you know, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But I, what I'm trying to say with that 
um, even in those situations, like, okay, so you took this on and maybe this band is just like, oh man, you're, you're just dragging them the whole way. I like to work with people where we're both, it's, it's a team effort, right? Like you pass the ball to me, I pass it to you back and forth to the benefit of everybody, as opposed to like, you get a band here and it's just like, they don't know how to dribble the ball. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to play this game by myself and, and, and really drag you guys the whole way, which yeah. I'm not really interested in doing. I like when bands are here and they learn something from me for sure, but I like to learn some stuff from them too. And I do from pretty much everybody. And that's always been a philosophy. I always learn from everybody. So it's been a constant, uh, I don't know, learning process. But man, I really want to answer your question properly. I'm just trying to think. I don't think I've, get, I've given a, a straight answer on that. I mean, what you did say a couple things now? there that helps though, you know. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> But no, no, I'm, I'm generally pretty, I don't know, pretty content with um, the way things have gone. I have really no big regrets other than just, like I said, you know, maybe, maybe letting the passion of the project get the best of me sometimes and, sure. and, and, you know what I mean? Get, you know, get too emotionally invested in some of the projects, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I think it does sometimes turn sour when people are involved that don't have any passion about it and they yeah. don't have any compassion or understanding for your just drive to make this, you know what I mean? And being emotionally involved and you have someone that's just, you know, pushing a pencil. I got all these other records to do who care, you know what I mean? Whatever. We got to do this one and that one. I'm just like, man, but I'm, I'm so on fire about this. And <laughs> so being a little bit more maybe realistic about the implications, not, ah, it's, it's a complex thing, I suppose. And I, I don't want to admit I'm wrong in that scenario, even though I am super fired up about it. <laughs> so if somebody wants to uh, work with you or if they maybe have some other questions, want to pick your brain some more, where can they go to get a hold of you? Where can they go to book you? Uh, yeah. Um, you can, uh, if you go to joshschrader.com, it's spelled Schrader, like Ricky Schroeder. Some people say Schroeder. I'm from a more like traditional Mennonite community. So it's more Shreda, like the way they say it in Plautich. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I pronounce it. I don't really care how people pronounce my, my name. I've gotten over that. Um, but it's, um, yeah, joshschrader.com. You can look up discography. The different It's annotated with the different things that I did on different albums. Some albums, it's just a mixing job or a mastering job. Some song, it's co-write. Some albums, it's, you know, whatever, a mix of everything. Um, but yeah, I'm on Facebook. I mean, don't be shy to hit me up. I like talking to people. I, it's, it's, you know, I think a lot of people, I, I think to myself sometimes too, like, cause I'm just a person just like you, just, a, you know, we're all just people. But I think, I think back to when I was a kid and I was thinking, oh my gosh, hitting up Andy Wall or any, any producer of any sort, Ross Robinson, hmm. they're just people. You know hmm. what I mean? I, you know, I, I like talking to people. I, I love what I do and I'm always glad to talk about music stuff so yeah don't be shy about hitting me up on facebook it's just i don't i don't go on that often i don't i try not to make a habit to stay off social media as much as possible but sure you know a quick conversation yeah no problem it's 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 always a lot of fun to hear from people um but uh, yeah or, or instagram or twitter it's all it's all pretty easy to find me there i think i have the i think my wife put all my social links on my website so I should be covered. Yeah, and they'll all be down in the description of this episode for you guys as well. Oh, so you guys thanks. Can... Oh, yeah, of course, man. You got You're it. a pro, Kane. <laughs> You're a real pro. <laughs> hey, what can I say? I've been doing this for like two years now, so nice. pretty pretty veteran podcaster here. <laughs> How many podcasts have you done? Uh, So over 150, wow. so probably closer to Good 200 job. now. Yeah, and nice. you know, it's been every single week except for one week when George Floyd died. I wanted to take that week off and just... Mm. you know, let people kind of, uh, focus yeah. on that for a minute. But yeah, we've done every single week. We've had guests on every week and this is, uh, the second episode of season seven actually. And I'm trying to get a cool. bunch of producers on this season. So I'm trying to talk to Joey Sturgis, Andrew Wade, oh, nice. uh, yourself obviously. And, uh, Chris Crummett, you know, we've got a bunch of producers that I'm trying to reach out to. So hopefully oh, we can cool. get some more on here. Oh, that's great. I appreciate it. I appreciate the invite. Of it's, course. It's nice. And uh, I will share this around. We'll get some more traction from a few audio nerds that will check out your um, your podcast then. All right, guys. That was my episode with Josh Schrader. I absolutely loved this conversation that we had. We went over our time. I told him it would be about 30 to 40 minutes, and we just kept kept talking. And I love that about podcasts, that you can just keep going and 
you know, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, please leave a rating and feedback. And if you do leave a rating and feedback, I will actually send you a signed photo print from an abandoned building that I have photographed. Uh, when I'm not freelancing, I take photos of abandoned places. So if you guys want a signed photo print, all you got to do is leave a rating and feedback and send it to at Project Freelance, either on Instagram or Twitter, and I will get you guys a signed photo print. And if you do have more interest in my photography of abandoned places, I also have a book out called No Tracers, An Urban Explorer's Diary, which is full of photos and stories from my urban exploration adventures. So if you want to check that out, you can go to notracers.com slash shop and pick up a copy of my book today. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of Project Freelance. I will talk to you again next Monday. If you want to be on the podcast or if you know somebody that wants to be on the podcast, please shoot me an email at contact at just the letter K dot com and we will uh, get you on or I will reach out to whoever you guys want and have them on the podcast. Like I said a little bit ago, I'm trying to get a bunch of producers on this this season, season seven. So if you are an audio producer or audio engineer or you know an audio engineer, I would love to chat with you. So reach out. Let's get in touch. Thank you guys for listening. Stay strong. Keep enduring. Go out and go create something.